welcome again to this seminar and this webinar. And before we start the panel discussion, we, uh, I will say a few words about the global Bergen School of Global Studies and a few words about the global uh, health as such and, and the Center for International Health, which is central in this regard. Just a tiny introduction before, before we start um, our discussion. Uh, okay, so um, the Bergen School of, of, of Global Studies, it brings together uh, graduate programs and courses across all seven faculties at the University of Bergen. Um, and the school the, offers programs that are illuminating the complexity of challenges that are facing the world today. Uh, and I should say that the Bergen uh, School of Global Studies, it rests on five pillars and we need to introduce them. Okay, next slide, which is here. Okay, and as you see here at this uh, very nice figure, you see the five pillars, they consist of governance, inequality, climate, migration, and health. And health is of course, what we're going to concentrate on today. Um, so these are the five pillars that you need to keep in mind. Okay, uh, now moving us to, to global health, just with one slide. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, it has demonstrated fully the complex, the interconnected and the sociopolitical nature of global health challenges. And it's calling for intersectoral and multidisciplinary types of approaches. And this is partly what we're going to discuss in, in a couple of minutes, at least parts of it. Uh, we need to mention that the Center for International Health at the University of Bergen, it lies under the Department of Global Public Health and Primary Care. Uh, that is a leading center for global health education and, and research in, in Norway. And the center engages in academic discussions related to pertinent uh, and, 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 and relevant global health policy and practice. Uh, and as you see on the screen, it has a broad multidisciplinary educational and research agenda. Uh, and let us mention just briefly some of the areas that we really focus a lot on. Maternal, adolescent and child health and nutrition. Uh, we, there are scholars who uh, focus on infectious, diseases, TB, malaria, HIV, etc. There is also an increasing interest for migration, climate, environmental health. This is coming up as emerging and very uh, stronger uh, topics by the day. And not the least, the social and political determinants of unequal health distribution and unequal burden of disease. That is also part and parcel of what we're doing across these, these fields. So uh, finally, um, the master's program here, yeah, as I clicked correctly, the master's program in global health at CIH, it is a special environment. It recruits students from all over the world and it offers a stimulating cross-cultural classroom environment, which is extremely inspiring. And the Bergen School of Global Studies offers courses with global health relevance across the different pillars. So all those Center for International Health and BCEPS, as we will hear in a moment, is central in this regard. Uh, we also see that global health is, is a part and parcel also of other programs, master programs at, in, at the University of Bergen. So with these few words, I would just like to say welcome to the University of Bergen for the ones who are trying, would like to apply to us. So I think this brings us to, to the debate uh, as such. I think we should close here now for this small introduction. So then Corinne Marie Moulin will lead us in the, and be our, our moderator for for our coming discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Astrid. <clears throat> well, using the, the film that, that I hope you saw, those who are also with, me, with us online and those who are with us here in this room, 
the film that we saw, Ish Kanul, we'll use that as a starting point to discuss a series of issues um, that lie at the core of the complex field of global health. And after this debate, there will be possibilities for the onlineers and also for the people in the room. Oh, this way. Sorry. Look at the panel. Okay, so after this uh, panel discussion, it will be possibilities to ask questions to the to the panel. But before we start the discussion, I will introduce the panelists. And um, well, I'll still look this way. <laughs> so I'll start with Astrid, who just presented now. Um, the, the Center for International Health and the Global Health uh, course that we're providing there. Astrid Brista is a professor at the Center for International Health, at the Department of Global Public Health and Primary Care, and she's a social anthropologist and a nurse by training. She's, uh, she has 30 years of experience in reproductive health and, uh, and uh, in global health policy. Um, primarily from, uh, from uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. And she has led a number of research projects focusing on maternal health, on HIV and safe abortion services. Then to her left, we have Anna Lorena Ruana Ruano, who's a, who is as a sociologist working as an associate professor at the Center for International Health. Lorena is, managing a, is the managing editor for the International Journal of Equity and Health. And she is uh, the research coordinator for the Center of the Study of Equity and Governance in Health Systems in Guatemala. Long name. <laughs> so she has uh, 20 years of experience working with bottom up and citizen led approaches for improving healthcare for indigenous people in Guatemala and globally. Next to her is Ingrid Sandre. Ingrid is a medical doctor and epidemiologist working as a professor for the Center at the Center for International Health. And she is also the deputy director of CISMAC. And CISMAC is a center for intervention studies in maternal and child health. CISMAC runs projects in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And Ingrid is currently running um, uh, a big intervention study um, as uh, in Zambia as the, the main investigator. Now, the man in the crowd here <laughs> is Shenar Johansson. He is a medical doctor and a professor in medical ethics and philosophical science at the Bergen Center for Ethics and Priority Setting, which is also located at the Department of Global Public Health and Primary Care. He has extensive experience in population ethics research and fair priority settings in global health. His key area of expertise include economic evaluations, equity in health outcomes, and financial risk protection. Shelarna is currently principal investigator of projects in Zanzibar and India. And finally, um, my name is Karin Maria Mulas. I'm also a professor at the Center for International Health. I'm a social scientist and a nurse, and I've worked with reproductive health in Sub-Saharan Africa since the early 80s. So here we are. And um, now we have just watched the film Ish Kamil, and I would like to ask Lorena to start commenting and contextualizing the film for us. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Ishkanul is one of a set of three movies by the director Jairo Bustamante. And uh, the way that he sets it out is that each of the movies represent a core insult in Guatemalan culture. With Ishkanul being Indio, which is the racial epithet for indigenous people in Guatemala. Then we have two other movies, Tremors, which comes, which is about um, homophobia. And then the insult is hueco. And then we have La Llorona, which is a movie about the genocide. And you know, Guatemala is the only country in the world that has uh, convicted a general, General Rios Montt, for genocide inside the, the country. And so the insult there is communist. 
With these three insults, you're able to take anyone down from wherever they are and lower them or completely erase whatever it is that they're saying. So for example, if I comment on the need for improving health services in the public, the public health services, that someone just calls me communist, devalues everything that I said. Guatemala is also a deeply unequal country. In its 200 years of independence, which we'll achieve in September of this year, uh, very little of a state has been built. There was a civil, apart from the years of uh, strife throughout the 500 years that Guatemala has existed, there was a civil war that lasted for about 40 years from the late 50s, 60s to the end of the last century. During that time, there was a genocide against the Maya population and 250,000 people were directly affected. Peace was signed in 1996, but very little changes are result. And the endemic corruption and very low levels of taxes means that the state is a, a failed state, if not, it, and all the institutions are completely co-opted. The population in Guatemala is very poor. 60% of the population in total is poor, but only 35% of my ethnicity is poor, while 80% of indigenous people are poor. 46% of under five children are malnourished, but only, but only 30% of my ethnicity is malnourished, while 66% of indigenous people under fives are malnourished. I can expect to live 72 years, but an indigenous person can expect to live 59. And while 91% of the people in my ethnicity can read, only 35% of the women like Maria can. It's a very complex place with a missing state with no services and where racism is rampant. And it's very difficult to think about how you can move forward. Thanks, Lorena, for bringing into the, us into this context, dramatic context of of Guatemala, which we've really seen demonstrated in the film. But I, I'd like to bring us a little bit back to the film and, and ask you how common you think that the stories that we saw in the film are to, to Guatemala in Guatemala. It's very common. Um, Guatemala has the highest rate of teen pregnancy and, and girl pregnancies in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and this reflects the place of women. We are underrepresented in the economy, in the sciences, in, in every aspect of life. And our scope for behavior is very small because we must remain good girls above everything. The religious fundamentalism in the country further excludes women from living out real equal lives to men. 50% of teen pregnancies in Guatemala uh, happen with women that are shorter than one and a half meters. 80% of the women that or girls that become pregnant have to leave school. These pregnancies are not, they're the result of sexual abuse. There is no 10 year old, there is no 11 year old, there is no 13 year old that can consent to sex. Mm. And yet every year we see the numbers of mothers, of girls that become mothers between the age of 10 and 13 grow with uh, out of, I think 60,000 teen pregnancies in 2016, uh, more than 500 were of mothers that were under the age of 13. There is, although abortion is legal under specific cases, the religious fundamentalism in the country makes it so that no one wants to make a child that was raped also a murderer. And so it's practically impossible. And these girls go on to not, fulfill any goal in their lives. And, uh, and it's, what we saw in the film is actually that the baby was taken away from her uh, against her will, or she didn't know what she was signing for. And, and, uh, and uh, what, what is likely to happen to that baby? That baby was probably sold in a private abortion, a private uh, adoption market. This was very common. So when I was a teenager in the mid nineties, um, Near my parents' house, there was actually a casa cuna, which is a, a house where you keep babies waiting for adoption. And it turned out that they were all there for to be sold. The leader of that house was our chancellor up until uh, 2020. So she remained in power and, and got 
away with everything, with selling hundreds of children. And I remember in the 90s also, all those five-star hotels in Guatemala City, full of Americans and Europeans, white Americans, white Europeans, here to buy their baby. I don't think most of them knew that they were buying a baby, a stolen baby, but they were. And we know, of course, that this is not limited to Guatemala, but this is actually a global uh, problem, that babies are being traded like this. But let's now move to the others in the group and ask, uh, now the film brings up a lot of uh, all issues relevant to global health, and I would like you, the others here, to comment on what they would like to, uh, that what they found particularly illuminating to global health in this film. Starting with uh, English. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think one of the uh, things that the film illustrates is how marginalized populations uh, and inequity puts people at risk of a number of health hazards. Um, because obviously we're very focusing on the health aspects here today. There is a lot more to say about the film, but mm -hmm. that's that's what we are um, here to discuss, to focus more on. Um, so, as you say, you know, they, the fact the people that we saw in the film, they were illiterate. They obviously had, didn't have access to education, mm -hmm. and then. In addition to not being able to read the papers and understand what the uh, the medical people at the hospital were saying, it also probably prevented them from knowing how to protect themselves from a number of health hazards. Um, one thing being the snakes in the field, um, which is a, um, a, neglected, a neglected public health issue in a number of, of countries, mm -hmm. affecting poor farmers much more than obviously uh, those in power um, and which leads to um, yeah millions of people are bitten by poisonous snakes every year and um, it's estimated that 130,000 people die of snake bites um, and although we have drugs and venoms to treat that um, those also are not always available where <laughs> peasants work where they did um, and the, I think we could talk a lot more about that afterwards but that's just one issue uh, then obviously this girl didn't know that she could get pregnant from having sex the first time she's not been taught to know basics of sexuality education mm -hmm. and that puts her at risk and, I, and in general living um, being marginalized and poor just uh, creates stress in people's lives and makes them, well, both, and that uh, increases the risk of a number of diseases, but it also makes it more difficult to develop good health behaviors um, to protect yourself. So, mm -hmm. and then there's the other aspect of it, uh, where they obviously don't have access to good health services when they need. So they have to travel very long distances and they don't get the needed care that they need because they can't pay. And said they are, and the baby is actually sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some initial thoughts for me. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, what can I say? I'm sorry, I didn't think about global health when I saw the film. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was uh, sucked into the film, and it really uh, was uh, a fascinating film. And I really loved the scenes. The mm -hmm. they were so long. Uh, I, I, it was, uh, and also the you, we got so close to the facial expressions, and the faces were really just burned into my retina. And I really, I, I, so it made um, made me think after the film that oh, I need some data now because I need to think about uh, global health and and try to zoom out. So thank you, Lorena, for giving us all the data and. Uh, mm. But I didn't think much about uh, global health when I saw the film. I just saw a poor family and the love they had to each other in, in, in all the crisis they had. That was so strong. I really liked mm. how it was impressive how they managed to get that uh, love uh, mm. in the family yeah. under those circumstances. Uh, and, uh, so, I, so I liked the film and I agree with all the tragic things mm. you mentioned. Uh, it, 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 it sort of the film illustrated it, but in a very 
non-sentimental way mm -hmm. i was thinking of it was similar to like it was a mix with utvandana and ingmar bergman in guatemala and it was very really, realism <laughs> yeah, really. yeah i loved the film but i didn't think much about global health but it has so many elements that you have mentioned all that we i hope we can discuss yeah yeah and in amidst all this drama and suffering it's a beautiful film and it's uh comes across as very as a sort of the love that you explain or that you mentioned is very strong comes across very strongly Astrid would you like to add to this no I well I think basically the same as, as the others of course the the inequity issue is just glaring in a sense right and I think in Guatemala it's very much based on race actually or actually yes. race you're talking more about than ethnicity don't you which I think is yeah. very very interesting I think that comes out more clearly mm. in, in the Latin American context. And I, I think, and I agree with you, in, Jelarne, in many ways, you don't immediately think about global health. At least the, there is hardly an issue here that doesn't have repercussions somehow in key issues that we are talking about in global health. So I think it has that, that it's interesting to see such a film that is not an immediately, it's not a, it's not a film that we immediately th think about as a global health film. But at the same time, it has the core dimensions here uh, are, are, you know, at the core also of global health, uh, in a sense. And, and I mean, in the inequity in Guatemala, it's, it emerges as a race kind of based thing. In other parts of the world, it's, it can be an urban rural kind of thing, you know, it can more, really be more of, a, more of an ethnicity kind of thing. It can be uh, you know, really education based. I mean, there are so many reasons, and, and of course, uh, purely poverty or you know, the differentials, uh, differentials be between uh, the, the rich and the poor. I mean, the economic fundament. So, so I think the, 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 the it's somehow this, it's really staggering this inequity dimension, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, ending up with her child being taken away. Mm -hmm. So, so the it's a very powerful. For, for film, and I think we can bring up lots and lots of issues because, of course, it also has to do with with uh, adolescent health, with um, the maternal health. It has to do with the cultural dimension in 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 in, in which is also key in global health. Uh, and so we could just go on and on. But I, I, I so we yeah. will get back to those issues. Yeah, but let's stay a little with with the inequity issue first. And as we saw in the hospital, this uh, the Zamaya girl. Maria met with health personnel, which and she was exposed to quite extreme uh, discrimination to the extent where, as we have said several times, her child was actually taken away from her, stolen away from her. And Lorena, having worked with uh, with uh, in equity and health in Guatemala, how how can one address this issue? How you who worked in an organization trying to improve things, how do you work with issues like this? How do you work to sort of empower communities that are? So for the last 15 years, we've been working with a group of um, community leaders that come from mostly indigenous uh, municipalities in Guatemala, which usually lie on the, on the Altiplano, on the rural highlands. Um, the first step is to help these communities and these leaders understand and take be aware and raise their consciousness of the origin of this inequality, of understanding that all of this inequality lies in a line that's connected to their skin color and to their ethnicity. This is the real issue and having them understand this and use that anger and use all the other feelings that arise to this to get organized and to, to fuel the fight, to understand rights, to understand the legislation, the legal frameworks, what they're entitled to is what's the, the key for change. Until you raise awareness and you build citizenry, you can't expect the state to provide services. Okay, <clears throat> so, thanks. So let's, let's move to one of the issues that uh, you brought up, Astra, to, to early marriage and, and, and child, uh, early childbearing. The film, again, touches on, on early marriage and you have worked with this issue, Ingrid, and um, why would you say that um, that early marriage is a problem from a global health perspective? Yeah, so early marriage, it's obviously a human rights violation also, but from a global health perspective, we're, um, 
concern because uh, about um, early marriage because for one, it puts an effective stop to a girl's possibilities of becoming educated. So when she gets, gets married, that's the end of her school career. Uh, and that obviously makes it uh, difficult for her to become economically independent later in her life. Um, with, without education, you don't get a, a job um, in the formal sector. And um, girls who get married early generally tend to um, get a much more subordinate role in in a family, in the marriage, and also has a higher risk of you know, having to live, live through interpartner violence and yeah, all of that. So that's one aspect, that's some of the social aspect of it, which has health repercussions. But then obviously a girl who's gotten married, even if she's very young, she's expected to get pregnant immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing such as family planning in most countries before you've had your first child. That's not unthinkable. Huh? Um, and if she's very young, that puts uh, particularly uh, below 16, but also pregnancy below um, before the age of 18, is um, associated with a number of health complica uh, complications. Uh, the, the risk is much higher. So um, she may die from it. She may have um, uh, problems afterwards, like a fistula. Uh, it's quite frequent that such pregnancies, if it's an unwanted pregnancy, it will obviously can end in an abortion, but within marriage, it's usually in a wanted pregnancy. But um, for the baby, there's much higher risk of dying uh, during the neonatal period or being born too early or being very, having a low birth weight when um, born and that gives a much higher risk of a number of diseases and disabilities and yeah, if the baby survives. And unfortunately we know that the, the number of pregnant teenagers not going down, early marriage not going down in the wake of, uh, of COVID-19 is going up mm -hmm. as, uh, as children, especially female children fall out of school. So this problem is now escalating actually. And what can be done about it? How can we address this issue? I think it has to be addressed in a number of ways because we also know there are a number of, of causes of early marriage. So poverty is obviously very central. I mean, it's, early marriage is practiced more among poor families. It's a way to secure a girl financially in most societies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in addition, in some societies, there's a bride price, which may be an extra motivation to have a girl married off. Um, then, um, if it may be due to um, or early marriage has to do with social norms. So you have ideally you should we should do some something to change those social norms, but that's not easy. And norms take maybe generations to change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, in order to deal with um, yeah to give girls alternatives and to get married, obviously free education is important so that there are, it's not only for the for those with a lot of resources or money that can send their children to school um, i think I'll, i would like to go to ask you know and, and because you raised this issue of behavior and uh, you know what we can uh, uh, how how culture sort of plays into this and uh, the film mostly raises a number of of, um, <clears throat> of issues related to culture and it also emerges as the, the, um, the foundation for the severe discrimination and inequity. But um, culture is also seen as a barrier in global health discourse. So um, how, how, how do you, can you give, get your reflections on this issue that, um, that culture very often is perceived or conceptualized as a barrier? in global health yeah this is of course a huge a huge issue uh, but uh, in principle we do we do of course see that uh, that there is a discourse in in a strong discourse in global health where we see culture uh, being fronted as a barrier we saw it very early in the hiv um, epidemic of course where it was talked about, you know, the, 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 the customs of having multiple partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it lasted for only a few years. And then 
it, it became clear that the, the research showed that it had a structural dimension. We talked about the pores of the poor. Uh, it was the, in the very beginning that you saw these richer men with many, many partners who became positive, HIV positive, but very quickly the whole trend turned and one saw that it, this had a resource dimension. So that is, uh, that is yeah, that, that is something that we see uh, time and again in, in, in global health, for example, within maternal health, to just take another example, uh, you have, there is of course an enormous focus and it's almost a mantra uh, and in many ways an important mantra in global health to, to have so-called facility birth. Get as many women as possible to give birth at uh, give birth at a health facility and not give birth at home. In Ethiopia, it's still around 70% of the women who give birth at home. Uh, the rest of East Africa, uh, around 50%, a little bit less. Okay, and then, then so, so then the discourse goes, well, why don't they come to the, to the hospitals? Uh, and then the somehow, to put it in maybe, uh, you know, in, in, in very simplified terms, uh, there is the, 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 the cause for the delay or somehow the blaming of the delays is women being, being, uh, being, being delayed at home for all kinds of cultural reasons, uh, gendered reasons, you need to ask your husband. Uh, and, and, but whereas the structural reasons, the financial reason for women not coming in terms of the enormous cost just of coming to the hospital, which sometimes it actually means that you get into debt where you need to pay the, 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 the driver for two years in order to pay back the money just for getting to the hospital. And then in addition to that comes, of course, buying gloves and medication, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, it's another tiny, but at the same time, a huge uh, example of how global health has a tendency uh, of, of very quickly talking about the cultural barriers and, and, and people's perceptions, norms, uh, practices, and that is a barrier to optimal use of the health service. Whereas, and that is somehow convenient in many ways because it avoids us moving into the field of, of the resource part, both at, at, at a local level that the nurses can say that, you know, they were delayed and that is why, why she died at hospital, she came too late. And sometimes certainly that is the case. At the same time, you see that this, is, this kind of discourse also is played out at national level, at global level. It's far easier to talk about uh, the cultural and the lack of knowledge kind of dimension than actually bringing up the far more tricky uh, uh, fundamental unfairness in terms of distribution, distribution of, of, of resources. So, so uh, yeah, so it's this culture structure kind of thing that is, uh, is uh, uh, at the heart of this. So that is uh, at least one important uh, dimension. <clears throat> So this, this brings us uh, to the access issue, and you've touched upon it now when it comes to maternal health. And uh, Ingrid, you have worked with uh, access and uh, with uh, to what extent is access to reproductive health services uh, a problem for adolescents in other parts of the world, rather than what the, which also this, the film illustrates uh, the access problem. So what, what is your views here? Yeah, so access can be a problem both because uh, health facilities, at least for rural populations, may be far away. Uh, so you just can't go and get the services you need easily. But access is also limited uh, because of uh, the, reac the are reactions that young people meet when they come to the health facilities. So um, they may encounter health personnel who do not think it's appropriate for a girl to be sexually active. Um, and they will not, does not, not counsel her on use of um, contraceptives. Um, and they will certainly not provide it. And in many countries, it's not, uh, health personnel would not, I mean, we would in, in our context think that it's professional, a professional thing for health personnel is to think about, not to think about the moral aspects of the behavior that the, the patients are engaging in, but that, that's not the view shared by health personnel all, all over the world. They would rather see themselves as parents mm -hmm. and who should guide the, the, <clears throat> the child to behave appropriately. Yeah. Uh, and 
So meeting such reactions, but also being worried about confidentiality and the lack of privacy in most, most of uh, such facilities would um, make it in many cases better to go to uh, maybe a traditional healer or you know, go somewhere completely different mm -hmm. of the services you need. Or then mistreatment is the main reason mm -hmm. in Guatemala, at least. In the country, everything is free. All health services, all education is free. But indigenous people, browner people, encounter such racism and such vulgarity when they are, when they are there that they never go to the services. So it, it isn't just a barrier of paying for it. And then we encounter all these illegal charges also. That emergency transport, like we saw Maria pay, that is free by law. And yet we have encountered in our work that they get charged something ridiculous, like that, that trip could cost 500 crowns when a bus ride costs two crowns, right? So there's no rhyme or reason for the charges. Families go deep into debt for it. And then they, I mean, it's catastrophic health expenditure in an illegal charge. And then they go there to get called whores and to have their baby stolen or to be maimed so that they can't have children in the future, as was the case in Peru for many years. And it's, it's difficult, it's a complex landscape, but I think not necessarily everywhere in the world, but in Guatemala, all of these inequities are along at the color of your, the line of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. The darker you are, the poorer you are. And every, every Guatemalan that sees me will think that I am very, from a very high socioeconomic status because I'm light skinned and because I have curly hair. And so someone with a lot of money, but with darker skin and straight hair will not get treated nicely. This is a hard fact of life and, and for Guatemalans. I want to say, Jelana, do you have, you've worked with catastrophic uh, health expenditures. Uh, do you have any comment? Yeah, I think you explained it uh, well. The, because I, I was thinking a bit about what happened in between the cuts in the film, because there are lots of things going on that we don't see. Because what the problem here are many, but one of them is that she got bitten by a snake. And to get treated, as you said, you need a snake venom. And that is very expensive, hard to get. And if they have it at the hospital, the question is who pays for it? And, uh, I, uh, I, and that could be one of the reasons why the husband to be, uh, had to sell the baby to be able to afford the snake venom. We don't know, because it's extremely expensive uh, with snake venom. So that could be the case. And the transport would cost money. And, I, and, and very often with snake bites, the kidneys will be affected. And we didn't see uh, what happened with the kidney, but it, maybe she was on dialysis mm -hmm. for many weeks uh, before she got home. And that's also very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say it's free on paper for everyone, mm -hmm. but in reality, I'm pretty sure dialysis is not for free. So maybe yeah. there was a huge cost uh, due to dialysis. So and, there was a very and, uh, and the husband uh, to be, maybe a way to handle it was to sell the baby just trying to understand maybe maybe he was not just evil but maybe there was also mm -hmm. <laughs> some kind of <laughs> rational explaining the clearly unjust uh, action that the husband did but the catastrophic health ex expenditure and poverty is uh, is, is clearly important here mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's rarely considered into priority setting that having a universal public finance of mm -hmm. these essential services also is financially good for countries because it buys economic productivity in homes that uh, mm -hmm. we could see here if they uh, could avoid paying for services like this. Mm -hmm. it, it would be beneficial for Guatemala as a country because productivity would increase. It's very interesting that you say dialysis. Dialysis is actually free, but it's the subject of a big problem now in Guatemala because the dialysis ward at one of the two national reference hospitals didn't have any health professionals. But politicians owed favors to families, so they gave out jobs of being nurses and being physicians to people that just had high school degrees. And so uh, 16 patients in the, in the dialysis ward died because the catheters were just being washed with water and then re-put, and the, no, there was no nurse to really put them in. So, it's, it's this problem, it is free. It's free on paper, 
people go, but, but they then they die. Yeah. And there, or you have NICUs and neonatal intensive care units that are infested with cats because someone brought cats in to kill, to, to get all the mice or the rats or health professionals get raped inside this same national reference hospital. It's just such a mountain. Well, yes, let's, let's, let's move on to, to this access, move further into this access problem that we have, have talked a little bit about. And it's, this becomes particularly acute when we have uh, an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy, as we also had in this story of Maria. And I would like to ask you, Astri, who worked with, um, with abortion issues in Eastern and, and Southern Africa, if you can reflect upon the conditions for access to safe abortion services in the areas where you have worked and done your research. Yeah, yeah, it's very true, true as you say, Maria. When it comes to the abortion issue, of course, the, the access problem often becomes particularly acute. Uh, and, and of course, the, the whole issue is extremely uh, politicized. And, and when it comes to the access issue, of course, this is partly linked up with very strict abortion laws. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there, is, uh, there is not a one-to-one -one kind of, 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 of relationship between a restrictive abortion law and, and lack of access. In fact, our research in Eastern and Southern Africa show that there is quite a, an ambiguous and, and paradoxical kind of relationship between, between the law and policy and actual access on the ground to abortion services. Maybe I could just mention a couple of examples. You, for example, Ethiopia has a relatively progressive law. Uh, coming from 2005, it was quite incredible that that came about. But that didn't mean that immediately uh, women and girls would have access to, to safe abortion. This took time because, of, of course, you have to maneuver in a landscape that in principle is highly religious against uh, abortion, at least in public discourse. It takes time to do the training. It takes time to drive out the services, which meant that even if you had a relatively liberal law, to the extent that actually the word of the woman is taking at face value, if you say you're raped, incest, underage, you should be listened to. So, so that meant that even within this, these frames of a relatively uh, liberal abortion law, it, was, it has certainly not been easy to get a safe access to a safe abortion. Although things are changing now, and there is a very interesting new IPAS report that shows that radical things are happening. On the other side, you have the case of, of, of Tanzania, which has a very um, restrictive law. Uh, but at the same time, our studies showed, on the ground studies showed that women are still, at least in the urban areas, are able to access at least relatively safe abortion, not the least due to the, you know, the, the sale over the counter of, of uh, illegal, yes, of misoprostol. But of course, it's, we're still talking about relatively safe abortions because they don't have the medical follow-up. They don't have the prescriptions to know exactly how many pills they're, <clears throat> they're going to take. So we're talking about a relative kind of access. But still, it's, uh, I think for us, it's important to note that what we believe is a relatively uh, unproblematic relationship between uh, law and policy certainly doesn't always correspond with what the, 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 the actual possibilities of, 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 of girls are. But in principle, there is a huge uh, access uh, problem in large parts of the world. And we know that, in it, that uh, unsafe abortions make up a huge part of up to 30% of maternal mortality. So it is, it is a huge access issue that we are, we are talking about in general. And at the same time, we, we, we know that uh, this field is getting increasingly politicized, Astrid, and, uh, and abortion, it's particularly evident within abortion. And, uh, but it has repercussions also for other reproductive health fields. And can you please comment on, on the recent developments here? Well, I, I think maybe it's, it, these are well-known ca known cases. Of course, we know that, for example, again, the, the reproductive health in general is relatively uh, politicized. And, and at the at the UN level and far beyond. And of course, again, if we move back to the abortion issue that we worked with earlier, that is extremely politicized. And of course, we all I think we all know about the, the Mexico policy, the, the global gag rule, 
that was uh, reinstated by Ronald Reagan in, in 84, and it's been going on and off for, for, for ages, uh, and of course being uh, reinstated every time you have a Republican president. I think you may need to explain it. It's may not be everybody who knows what it is. Yeah, yeah, so maybe. So the gag rule, what it, what it actually implies is that U.S. aid does not fund uh, reproductive health services that in any way include abortion. Um, uh, and, and of course, U.S. aid, uh, it finances about half of the whole uh, health budget, half of all aid that goes to, for example, the African continent is, is uh, financed by U.S. aid. And, and that means that um, and and in, during the Trump years, it became far more radical and had huge implications far beyond abortion. It had repercussions for, for contraception, contraceptive distribution, for ADL, HIV work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which means that it makes the whole field extremely certain. And we are talking about a continent with an enormous ex, uh, population growth and explosion in a, at the time of a growing climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a, quite an extreme scenario where you're watching, where you're actually uh, reducing so dramatically the possibilities for, uh, for even talking about contraception at the African continent. And then in, in, and of course it will increase abortion rather than reduce abortion uh, when it has such uh, repercussions. So yeah, so that was a comment on that yes. part of the politicization. There are many other examples, of course. Mm -hmm. I think time is flying very quickly here and we need to save some time for the audience to ask questions. But I would like to ask you, um, uh, Silarna, about your, um, your, your leading a project in Salzburg um, and work together with the Ministry of Health in the re revision of the essential health uh, care package, which is a key element of universal health coverage. And, um, and I would like you to say a little bit about how this work is going and what challenges you are facing in the, in designing this package. Yeah, just to zoom in to Zanzibar in Guatemala, they, it's around 18 million people and they spend $270 per capita on health. So that it's much more uh, they have much more, much better health system than they do in Zanzibar. In Zanzibar, mm -hmm. it's a smaller population, but they spend around thirty dollars per capita. So it's around ten percent of the budget we saw mm -hmm. from the film, uh, and that is important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about mm -hmm. here is universal health coverage. It's a nice vision to have, but on getting and universal health coverage means that all citizens have access to essential health services of good quality. They have a, someone translating to them if they meet the doctor that we saw didn't happen in the film. And it's all, uh, increasing coverage and also having good quality uh, of those services. But that is a, a, a nice dream to have. No country in the world has universal health coverage. Uh, Guatemala is far from universal health coverage compared to Norway, but Zanzibar is even further away from universal health coverage. And it's really fascinating working with uh, the Minister of Health in Zanzibar on this issue. And then, because uh, we got a huge task, we wanted to focus on NCDs to begin with two years back. And I met the health minister because I worked a year there as a psychiatrist at the, a hospital in Zanzibar. And then the health minister heard about a project we had in Ethiopia, where we were revising the whole essential healthcare package. And that's a huge task. Uh, and then he heard about this project and he asked me, can you do this in Zanzibar as well? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I was a bit hesitant in doing it because I knew it was a lot of work. Yes, <laughs> you, can, you have two weeks and you can do it. And then uh, okay. <laughs> uh, because it's like it's, it's planning the health reform for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's looking at the health finances of all services for them. I went home to Bergen, started thinking, talked to people in, uh, in our, our uh, center, Bergen Center for Ethics and Priority Setting, and we, it got fit into a larger uh, program. And then we said, yes, we can do it, but we can only do NC, uh, uh, and injuries. And then he said, no, you have to do it all. And then, oh. Uh, NCDs. And then we had to also look at the interventions for uh, reproductive health, 
we had to look at TB, HIV, and so we have such a large list of all health services, and they spend thirty dollars per capita on health. And uh, and and realistically, you could uh, plan for maybe two percent increase in the health budget per year, and then it's not much to play with. And uh, and when you want to aim for universal health coverage, and that is what we struggle with. Uh, and we try to do it systematically. We try to involve, engage the people. And that has been really fun because when you uh, designed the essential healthcare package, we, the main, one of the goals is if you make the wrong decision, it's fatal. Uh, and uh, if you make the wrong decision, several people may die as a consequence of that decision. And it's abstract, it's statistical mm -hmm. lives, but two years down the road, this will be real people. Mm -hmm. So you really have to think about it carefully. And there are lots of value choices here and uh, people will disagree. So we try to do it in a structured way and define criteria for priority setting. And then we learn from other countries and we have like the standard criteria when you define the package. It's, it should be cost effective. It should save the most lives. It should uh, uh, protect the most vulnerable people, uh, improve uh, equality. It should create financial risk protection, but then uh, during the meetings, we had 10 meetings and then a uh, fifth criterion came up that I've never heard before. And that is political acceptability. And that mm. was really interesting. And that is where <laughs> reproductive health is. Because reproductive health, to me, it, it's not about resources. It's about all the other things. Mm, and, uh, and, and the talking about abortion contraceptions in Zanzibar has been a real challenge and a headache. And I, we haven't found a solution to it yet, but we are struggling with it, I can say. So it's, um, it's the same as in Guatemala. Yeah. Mm. So that is back to the politicization of the area of reproductive health yeah. and uh, political acceptability becomes a very important yeah, and, and you, a barrier to, 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 to change. Yeah, because if you apply the standard criteria for priority setting, it's very cost effective, mm. scaling up safe abortion. You cannot, uh, with strict legislation, you cannot influence the abortion rates. People go and do abortions anyway. They yeah. go outside yeah. the country or they do it... Uh, in unsafe ways, so you cannot influence it. It's very cost effective because you prevent a lot of bad health consequences mm -hmm. due to this. So uh, it's a no brainer if you apply all the other criteria, except mm -hmm. maybe political acceptability. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so. I think it's time that we move on to the uh, to the audience and the, the questions from the audience. Carmelisa, please. Very interesting. Thank you for all the interventions. I have a question for Lorena. Um, mostly because we kind of are interested in similar things, uh, which is accountability and sort of working uh, from the bottom up. And you, you mentioned awareness raising and sort of uh, association. So people get together and, and create strength together. And I, I was thinking about, this is a standard formula um, for trying to get people to be aware of their situation and try to find solutions themselves um, for them because they know best um, what is happening to them. But there is a lot of backlash, especially, for example, in countries that are authoritarian, um, mm -hmm. in countries where inequity or inequality is so high, so poor people, even if they try to organize, there is always this structural barrier, even if you are aware. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could tell a little bit how is it possible to overcome some of these structural barriers? Mm. Yes, <laughs> but I think the main, uh, the main lesson learned is that participation works when you have time, when you can play a long game, and when the participation process leads to small but meaningful uh, successes. In the case in Guatemala is that we have a very comprehensive legal framework for participation. And we have this structure of participation that's meant to be bottom up, that goes from organized communities to organized municipalities to organized uh, departamentos or regions to national. And so at each level, they, the systems go up. So there is some sort of structure for this to happen. Of course, these are completely co-opted in many places. So it, it has to do with political will, but mostly it just has to do with being there and supporting people helping them move through the processes 
helping them raise awareness, understand the nature of things, helping them gain the skills and the abilities. And then also I think key is learning cycles. So we've worked with these leaders for about 15 years now. And during that time, we've changed our approach several ways because we use a learning approach. So we try to do something and then we evaluate it and we think about it, what worked, what didn't, why we talk to people, to the people, to our community defenders for the right to health is what they're called, what we call them. And we kind of try to move forward from them. We try to help them to think strategically instead of practically. And we try to help them to work um, in scale is the, the term in social accountability so that they're working at the local level, but also at the subnational level and at the national level so that they can impact at the different levels and in the institutions that have the power, the different aspects that are necessary to be in place for change to happen. Some things are very easy to act upon, like for example, abuse and discrimination, racism, those kind of things that don't really take money are very easy to change. But the unequal distribution of medicines in Guatemala, medicines are free. No one should be able to, should have to pay for any medicines. You should get them at the point of care. Fixing that, that's structural, that's systemic, and that's also something that can only be acted upon through the Congress, which is notably corrupt. And, um, and that makes it very difficult. And that means that we need time and that the leaders need time and constant training. Thank you, Siri. We have to wind up very soon. Yeah. They're going and to be. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for an incredibly interesting discussion. And, and actually, a lot of the questions are as I come across and then you answer. So that's, <laughs> so that's great. And I wanted, I actually wanted to ask about this also with Sibylla again. I wanted to ask you about how, how the structural health was sort of being discussed in blah, blah, blah. And I think it is, and I think it's, I think, yeah, all, all uh, health systems have issues of accessibility. I think some of the recent discussions that we have in Norway around the relaxation of drug stress is also a lot about different perspectives where accessibility and, and the symbolic nature of law and the symbolic nature of care is, is very important. And I think that's so, so, so I think that is, is, that is always important. And, it's, and it is so fascinating that it doesn't figure. In the literature almost at all. Mm. Because we all know <laughs> that when you want to do reforms, and sometimes we call it political will, but it is very often about political accessibility. It's not only that people are lazy or don't want to or corrupt, it's that this is sort of somehow mm. not acceptable. Mm. And <coughs> so I think that is something that needs to be incorporated much more in the literature. Mm. And I also think that the, that the, it is so fascinating, Lorena, to to listen to you and all your knowledge about, about what the, the, the structure is done and the debates in, in, in Guatemala. And I, and I wanted to also ask you about um, the, the, because that's also something you discussed earlier. There is this lack of, there seems to be a lack of decentralization of the health service. And is that also about acceptability of ways of living in a way? Or, and is this, is this <laughs> true? And is there a about, Sort of is there a, is is not making health services accessible to the indigenous population also a form of of uh, so is that also will in some way and also is it will at the policy level or is it about how healthcare providers act within the realm of discretion? I think I would like to answer your question using Cairo Bustamante's movie yeah. movies. So. The reason why indigenous people don't get care is because they're inferior, right? It's this idea that they are, and I, I feel reticent of saying the racial epithet, so I don't wanna say it, but because they're indigenous. So that's the line. The other one is, so the other is that saying that we, can, we should provide things to poor people brings out the third movie, you are communist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in a country, I mean, Guatemalans, Guatemalans work 48 hours a week, for example. And that's because they're so libertarian that they think that anything that's around human rights is communism, or it's to protect <laughs> uh, the villain, right? Or the lazy people or indigenous people that are just having kids nonstop because they can't, that's, it's not like that. So we have it on law that everything should be free, but in practice, what's been happening over the last 30 years is that chronic, uh, 
and consistent and structural defunding and breaking apart of all the institutions that we had. So if you would see Guatemala in the 50s, while Europe was being, you know what, the United States was reconstructing Europe and kind of helping it, they didn't notice us. So we built a welfare state. And so we had a lot of things <laughs> that we had enough. We had all of these institutions that you have here, but throughout the decades and with intervention from our neighbor from the North, <laughs> it's been chronically <clears throat> defunded and chronically weakened. We do have decentralization. It's part of the legal framework for participation, but why isn't it happening? Because it's gonna benefit people that the people in power don't care about because they can't steal anything if they are providing services. So I, I think that that's the, the core. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, that we need to close. Uh, it's uh, seven o'clock. So, and I'd like to thank all the panelists for the good discussion and the audience here and online for listening to us. And I would like, you know, equity has been the central thing that we've been discussing and it's located at the core of global health issues that we're dealing with. And now we are, in, with COVID-19, we are in this process. We are facing every day inequities in the, in access to, to 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 vaccines so it's a uh, it's um it's we're sort of living these days in the middle of these inequity crisis in terms of of covid and, and access to medicines and and um and, and so i will just like to end this panel on this on that comment and that reflection on uh, on on in newspaper this morning, it was said that now there is no more vaccines in Africa, and we have known that it's been a shortage all along, and this uh, very staggering inequality in distribution. While at the same time, um, the countries in the West is piling up um, for second and third and fourth and fifth round of vaccines. So this again um, shows that we have a lot to work with when it comes to the persistent in inequities in global health. So thanks a lot for taking part in this panel and we'll certainly continue the discussion.